Today, uh, last night, last night, last night, yeah. we were in uh, Hong Kong, mm -hmm. Tokyo. So, well, it's, well, it's not current; it's formality. But, yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> formality still has its place, correct? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Think so. <laughs> so we're recording this. Did you tell you? Yeah. 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 Okay. Cool. So, with your permission, here we are now. How are you finding your time in government? It's been more or less the same. Um, I've been working as a kind of advisor um, as a, uh, for the previous cabinet, but also working on open government. So for me, it's mostly just the cabinet telling me to not uh, focus any other time with, as an Apple consultant or as some <laughs> other valley companies and dedicate full time uh, to the public service. But otherwise, I've been doing more or less this in the life as what we call open government. But, right. Hence the report. Hence the recording, yeah, because it's it's a closed door meeting as you you requested, but then we would want uh, the other ministries who are actually in charge of re uh, related policy making. And my role in this government is a channel, so that uh, other ministries who could have participated in our meeting still has the same information. Is that right? Yeah. I was curious, what uh, so what area specifically are you spending most of your time on? Well, my three mandates are open government and then social enterprises, mm -hmm. and then the, what we call youth council, uh, which youth are council. youth council, yeah, and, and that's it. And so with, with open government, uh, I spend my time working on the output side, which is like open source, open API, open data, uh, which as I understand, um, there's the U US Digital Service also does a lot of the same thing. Uh, just today they launched code.gov, which is something that we very much are inspired. Uh, by uh, the White House, who there's this mandate that all the ministry has to open source 20% uh, of all their code. So this is something that we will want to, to learn from. And also the civil participation side, which is the input side. So we're involved in multi stakeholder meetings uh, in civil participation, participatory budgeting, and things like that. No, the data efforts have been terrific, I think. Mm -hmm. you know, just getting more tech talent, mm -hmm. not to make necessarily the current government, but to apply a few years. And mm -hmm. Both on data, but also the user experience, right? To make people's interaction with government as consistent as it is with the best private sector. Mm -hmm. I think really can go a long way to build in trust. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you know, it, the idea is that the government should focus on providing services uh, in form of APIs if necessary, and then the private sector and the civil society can design the best user experience right. as they want uh, using the API provided by the government. Uh, at a, previous century, uh, it's usually the front end and back end are built together. Right? And so it's strongly coupled and people can really change that and now we're trying to move to a so sort of decoupled architecture. Um, well, I'm curious, I mean, jumping into mm -hmm. yeah, sure. uh, kind of how you see, I guess, ride sharing specifically in some mm -hmm. of the debates in government mm -hmm. um, and how that relates to, obviously, the government's very clear that they want to have time on uh, I believe the term Silicon Valley of the West and really be a place of innovation. So how do you see some of the debates around ride sharing and the technology uh, aspects of that, how it fits into the government's broader uh, goals and ambitions? But we're, we're not trying to be the Silicon Valley of the West. There is a Silicon Valley in the West, uh, and that's the Silicon Valley. Um, one of my contributors... I'm sorry, Silicon Valley in Asia. <laughs> okay. It's my lack of sleep. No, 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 it's fine. It's fine. Right. But, but still, we're not trying to be a Silicon Valley of Asia. Uh, the plan we had was what we call Asia, uh, connecting to Silicon Valley. So Taiwan is like a connector that links with Asia and connects with the Silicon Valley. We're not trying to, to Shanghai or to copy uh, the Silicon Valley or be a copy of Silicon Valley. I, I think it's unique. I, I mean, until five weeks ago, I'm still working with Valley companies. Where were you living when you were out there? Right? Uh, I'm, I'm mostly based in Taipei. I visit uh -huh. the, the Valley from time to time, but I'm always based in Taiwan. So I'm telecommuting uh, full time. So in any case, um, the, the idea was to, to be a connection, a connector, a hub, if you will, and one of the many hubs, really, 
that links the other hubs in Asia. There's many, right? There's Singapore, there's Hong Kong, there's Korea, there's Japan, and so just to build a, a stronger link. So, so we're not trying to, to be the Silicon Valley, but we do want to connect uh, the talents, the regulatory framework, and everything, and so that we can um, connect better with our peers in the Silicon Valley. So that's the, the main vision. Right, so ride sharing, um, incidentally, is not part of the, <laughs> the Asia um, connecting to Silicon Valley plan because uh, we, for this plan in particular, we are focusing more on the deregulation or regulatory um, normalization. And there's, of course, from the Silicon Valley side, there's demands like the digital tourism and then also internet neutrality, open internet, those are very interesting. Um, things that we need to work on. And on the Asian context, we also have our regional like APAC privacy framework and also um, the EU uh, side of the privacy framework and we need to work on that as well. So um, ride sharing has not yet <laughs> came up on the agenda of the Asia Adopt Silicon Valley plan. That's, um, so that's just what it is. Well, we'd love it to be. Mm -hmm. And just um, if I could give you the elevator. So um, mm -hmm. obviously, you know, we're technology companies. Yeah. Our technology here in Taipei and elsewhere is basically creating economic activity on the ground in cities, mm -hmm. um, both on the rider side, mm -hmm. so people have a different way to get around, uh, in, a, in a ultimately a more affordable way. That doesn't compete with. I know the debate here in Taiwan in a lot of places starts with you know, sort of the old way taxi versus ride sharing, but every piece of data we see around the world suggests that the market flows. And there's some competition for the taxi market, but mm -hmm. we don't really talk about the taxi market in our company. Mm -hmm. We talk about the personal cars market. How we get people mm -hmm. to turn more of those trips into ride sharing, mm -hmm. maybe in connection with public transport. So then, obviously, on the driver side, it's creating a lot of economic opportunity mm -hmm. here. And so our hope would be that um, as many countries around the world have found a new regulatory framework that embraces ride sharing. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's important, obviously, I imagine part of the roadmap here is autonomous transportation, uh, you know, making cities uh, congestion-free, emissions-free, and I think this stage is pretty important in mm -hmm. getting people used to sharing cars. Because mm -hmm. ultimately, we'd love to bring carpooling here, which is two or three people on the Uber. We would also want to bring flying cars. Well, eventually, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Well, right. I mean, our view is let's look at every way to, to make our yeah. cities more mm -hmm. local. Yeah. So, but I think that this is a really important bridge to that autonomous future, mm -hmm. maybe flying cars, mm -hmm. and so in understanding that. Um, the way you regulate that, mm -hmm. um, as every law around the world has, mm -hmm. understand some of the differences between ride sharing and how we traditionally thought of uh, for higher transportation. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that basically the market's going to grow mm -hmm. and the way people get around cities changes. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, we're growing the pie, mm -hmm. not dividing the pie. Mm -hmm. and, and again, I think that um, it sends the message of you know, being uh, friendly towards innovation understanding that you know this device is so powerful mm -hmm. but it's creating a tremendous amount of work mm -hmm. in our case also changing the way people get around and it's really interesting because mm -hmm. it's not our tech's just not living on a crowd mm -hmm. in the cloud monetizing from above mm -hmm. so much of the economic activity is staying on the ground mm -hmm. here and improving people's lives mm -hmm. and so uh, again i hope that as you guys think through uh, how to regulate ride sharing. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you look at what other countries have done, there'll be some distinction mm -hmm. here, but we are really concerned with the reports are they're thinking about doing astronomical fines mm -hmm. for people just driving their own car, trying to make a little bit of extra money. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be a really damaging both signal to send, but also a terrible thing for those people who are, you know, they're retirees, they're teachers, they're entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. just trying to make a little extra money. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that will come to pass. And our hope is we can figure out the regulatory situation so then we can sit down with the development and say, okay, let's think about mobility, transportation, uh, economic growth, uh, more activity economically for retirees, uh, for women. Those tend to be the conversations we're having with government right now mm -hmm. in those places once we get through these sort of core regulatory questions. Mm -hmm. And they're not that complicated. I mean, at the end of the day, how to regulate body sharing is, is pretty much a known thing now. Um, and you know, they're just you know, the normal issues that we have to work through. Right, so to very quickly recap, um, a, a year ago I was uh, helping to facilitate a multi stakeholder discussion here on the VTAL platform just about exactly the regulatory structure that you talk about. 
who had thousands of uh, participants, both uh, Uber drivers, Uber X drivers, and also uh, traditional taxi drivers, but also people who are not yet drivers for any one side, but want, just want to uh, think, deliberate about this topic together. And then we had, um, of course, a lot of division of ideas, but because we employ a uh, machine learning platform that uh, takes the principal component of everybody's ideas and presents it in an easy to understand two dimensional form. So people still uh, arrive at some consensus, something very strong, like 95% consensus. And then we uh, made the regulatory structure based on people's broad consensus, even among people who are div divisive. Right, so one of the consensus uh, was basically taking Uber as a source of inspiration, uh, saying that it is true that we have a way to hail taxis that does not, you know, depend on the car having any yellow uh, paintings or any medallions or any other markers. It, it really is a, a new way to, to, you know, to call car. That's true. And then the other innovation that Uber brings is this uh, five-star system that let, lets uh, both not just the passengers but also the drivers um, to uh, who, who can also have a reputation uh, for the clients. And so I think these these are something that are very inspirational and that we do want to uh, learn from. So just uh, last month, actually, we passed this what we call the e-taxi regulation or more formally taxi diversification uh, regulatory structure. So that any um, company who just want to introduce these kind of non-painted yellow, non-medallion fleet uh, can apply to the Ministry of Transportation and also uh, operate just exactly really like Uber uh, with this five star uh, and uh, with the app that shows uh, the whole license plate number and then the driver's name and so on so that everybody has a transparency and record of what uh, exactly goes where. So, I mean, I thank you for, <laughs> for bringing the, the inspiration and I, I do agree that it is the consensus of regardless of who they're working from that we do have a regulatory structure for this and now we do have. So, um, of course, if, if Uber Taiwan is willing to register as one of the fleets, that would be perfect. But we're not a taxi company and, and no one regulates us that way in the entire world. Mm -hmm. So we are a tech company and the, the transportation that's provided, mm -hmm. uh, you know, criminal driving checks on their drivers, mm -hmm. insurance, vehicle requirements, mm -hmm. um, all that's part of the regulations around the world. Mm -hmm. um, but understanding the other advancement is not just the rate system, it's the safety that's happening on the trip. You know, full GPS tracking, mm -hmm. no anonymity. Yeah, these, these are in our regulations. Well. Right, but again, yeah. but, but uh, to, to suggest that we should register as a taxi company mm -hmm. is not the way it's been done anywhere else in the mm -hmm. world. And it will create too high barriers to entry. Um, someone who just well, someone who just wants to drive their own Toyota Prius for four weeks uh -huh. uh, ought to be able to do that normally, uh, as mm -hmm. long as they go through the right checks. Uh, and I think that that's really the tension here, uh, is trying to, to, and I appreciate that you guys have looked at this and made some adjustments, but trying to figure out how to shoehorn what we do into old taxi regulations, that has never been, uh, in our view, a, a, a good outcome or a satisfying discussion. It's more about how do we fashion new regulations? Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, a lot of people have looked at uh, you know, how to deregulate things for the taxi industry. Mm -hmm. and there's no question there's a lot of, whether it's giving them more um, supply flexibility or pricing flexibility, mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that we think make sense. And our view is this ought to be opened up and barriers to entry reduced. Right, we money. also put in the search pricing into the regulation. So, I mean, we, we really took everything that we did. And <laughs> <laughs> but again, but, but to, to basically say, you know, again, a teacher or a retiree, mm -hmm. someone should go through a tremendous amount of hoops to drive their own car for a few hours a week. That's where I think the tension is. So, uh, well, I mean, they just take, I don't know, four hours uh, to get a professional driver's license. It's not that much. It costs, I don't know, a, a few, um, not, uh, I, mean, I think less than 100, I don't know, US dollars. So this is not a huge or tremendous amount and indeed there's nothing in our new regulation that says they must drive full time or they must drive you know exclusively in business hours or anything like that so um i, I still fail to to appreciate where is the, the hoops in. well no i think i think getting a professional driver's license i think registering as a taxi company again these things i think are inconsistent with where you see platforms like uber and it's not just uber there will be other ride sharing companies mm -hmm ecosystems emerge around it um, that really are interesting. And I think part of 
I think, creating you know, even a, a stronger entrepreneurial class. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I think that's where the issue is. And we're happy to share some, some you know, ideas with you, okay. more specifically about what we'd like to see here um, mm -hmm. that would enable what we do really to flourish and have this threat of, mm -hmm. you know, my understanding is it's close to a million US dollar mm -hmm. fine for drivers. Mm -hmm. Which for, is, for, for not right. obtaining a professional right. license, I mean, yes. You know, that, mm -hmm. From a proportional standpoint, mm -hmm. seems, uh, I mean, there's nothing like it in the world. I mean, that would be the most extreme situation in the entire world that we've ever seen. We've seen a lot. I think we dialed it down from the France uh, fines, which yeah. it was modeled after. Um, so uh, the French law, I think it's slightly higher, maybe 10% higher. No, but in more. France, we have a very good business in France, but again, yeah. it, it, it makes it harder for someone who's just looking to augment their income. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you have all the safety requirements involved. We're not suggesting. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a, a misperception that we don't want to be regulated. We're regulated in many places around the world, mm -hmm. and believe that's appropriate. Right. So, so the, the main uh, contention, uh, I would put it, is just to to obtain a professional driver's license. You would like uh, drivers to not obtain a professional driver's license because it costs too much. Or well, it's much. more. I think. I think for someone again. Who's, who's just looking, they're not going to make this a career. They may even be doing it just for a period of time. We have a lot of students you know, in the summertime. Sure. All over the world, people just drive for a few weeks in December around the holidays. Sure. You know, so that, that we're, we are, uh, as we do elsewhere, um, you know, criminal checks, driver checks, insurance checks, sure. the vehicle requirements, all things that we think are appropriate. Yeah. But that the notion of someone having to then commit to become a professional driver, um, go to different government offices, that's something that generally we see is it a deterrent. And again, our view is um, citizens going out and making a little bit of extra money, um, you know, while you're still ensuring public safety is, you know, it's a wonderful thing. I mean, most people are all over the world, uh, not as satisfied as they'd like to be with their income situation. And in some cases, they just need a little bit more, whether that's over a period of time or whether it's episodically. And so that's, that's, that's where our philosophy comes in, and it's a very strong principle that there's ways to do the regulations that ensure safety, mm -hmm. uh, things like insurance, things like vehicle requirements, mm -hmm. but that have uh, lower barriers to entry so that people are able to really, uh, without taking a long time, mm -hmm. uh, you know, within a week they get on the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm not the Minister of Transport, but <laughs> from, from what I've, I've been personally through to obtain a driver's license, um, it, it's really not more than one week's time. Um, there is one exam, I think, and then one written exam, and that's about it. Yeah. It, it's not a, a required to be a professional driver. Uh, yeah, it's not a commitment for, for... We call the for taxi time. driver as a free occupation. That's mean you don't have to be a full-time job. Yeah, it, you really don't have to <laughs> make it... That is just a certification that you have less skill. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Right, and it, it's just certifying that, that you have uh, more skill than, than a you know, non-professional drivers. Uh, it's a, it's a skill-based examination, mostly about understanding the duties and responsibilities mm -hmm. as a professional driver. And that's, that's not a very high barrier of entry, personally speaking. But, but if it is, and if it does cause a problem, of course the Ministry of Transport can look into streamlining the process. But from my, from my personal experience, it's just involved going into one single office of the Ministry of Transport. It's not like multiple government uh, agencies. So if that's the only barrier that's preventing the current Uber drivers from obtaining a license, I'm sure that we can streamline the process. Well, just, I think, I appreciate that sentiment, mm -hmm. and we look forward to more discussion about that. Sure. But I think that's important, because the model is really based on um, the ability. And again, I think, you know, driving is something most of us can do. Mm -hmm. um, and with technology, it's made it even easier for someone to turn on the phone, turn on the car, and make a little bit of money. Mm -hmm. And so, what we see is there's plenty of people, and we want our platform to work for people, so you know what, this is how I'm going to spend most of my time, and this is going to be my major source of income. We certainly want to work for drivers like that and partners, but the real growth comes from people who are just doing this in a very supplemental way mm -hmm. and, and understanding that there's ways to provide regulations that I think, you know, give the public confidence on public safety, mm -hmm. um, but also um, understanding that um, you, to, to have somebody who could be making additional money for mm -hmm. a period of time not able to do that, mm -hmm. you know, that's a, a personal tragedy for them mm -hmm. uh, and, and their lives would be improved. The other thing mm -hmm. is you want to and I know this, this can sometimes be counterintuitive, but the larger ride sharing gets, the better effect you're going to have in terms of reducing congestion. Why? 
because no matter where somebody is in the greater Taipei area, they know they're going to be able to get a car in two or three minutes. Mm -hmm. And when they know that's the case, they use their car less. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, we don't have carpooling yet in Taipei, which we have in many parts of the world that we call Uber. But that's, I think, the big public policy benefit is convincing people now not just to use their car, to move their car, but they're willing to share a ride with somebody using technology to match that route for yeah, sure, sure. That's the sure. flywheel sure. you want. Sure. And so if, you, if, you, if you, through barriers to entry, you're limiting the supply, mm -hmm. it's not just that you're denying people the opportunity to make money. The whole system mm -hmm. kind of falls apart. Right, I mean, there is already Russian communities, usually around commutes to universities and so on in Taiwan. Uh, and so far, there's been no for profit, for profit operators because the law was not allowing uh, app based um, you know, car dispatch. But now, with the new regulation that was just passed uh, last month, we're now taking applications. So, we are now um, basically saying, okay, these are the professional drivers who, as we said, maybe they're riding on the street and then um, causing, <laughs> contributing to, to congestion because there's no planned algorithm right. uh, to, yeah, make that that to, right. to make that efficient. And we also have local um, and maybe non-local uh, technological companies who are willing to work with these fleets to, to make e-fleets uh, that serves uh, those underserved areas or the areas that has a lot of congestion. And that's already happened as of uh, a couple of weeks ago. We're now taking our first batch applications. So we do want to, of course, make the roads congestion free and eventually move to a more autonomous or semi-autonomous uh, cycle. Although I think uh, the flights that your auto branch, <laughs> the, the um, long haul, what we, what we call software defined rails, uh, will probably happen first because, because that's easier and, and contributes more. Uh, to the carbon neutral uh, footprint of the whole traffic industry. But I mean, all this we may agree in principle, and we are already putting in fact. Okay, well, I think, I think figuring out a way to remove this threat of massive fines on drivers who are just, you know, local citizens trying to make a little bit of money, mm -hmm. but also the notion we are a technology company. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, we believe that the transportation that's provided, there's a, a smart way to regulate that. Mm -hmm. But to really enable this to flourish, I think, because again, Uber Pool is something that only works when you've got enough liquidity mm -hmm. uh, and using technology. And, and you know, in some of our major cities now, 50% of the people who use Uber um, are not getting in the back seat by themselves or car pool. Particularly the younger generation. I've been to they Paris. They just break it. So you've used it in Paris? I've used it in Paris, yeah. yeah. It's great because it's, I mean, I think since the really since the early 70s, we've talked about how as a global community we can. Encourage carpooling on scale, and it's never really worked. There's casual carpools, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. but we're starting to see on scale a pretty big behavior change mm -hmm. around people's willingness to share rides. Mm -hmm. um, and with technology, you're only inconveniencing them in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. They get a half price ride. Mm -hmm. And you know, most of our drivers tend to gravitate towards fuel efficient vehicles. Eventually, those all get electric mm -hmm. as the price comes down. Mm -hmm. And again, so that's an important, I think that bridge is important to autonomy because. The autonomous future is going to rely on obviously technology being close to perfect and mm -hmm. the regulatory structure being in place, uh, infrastructure changes, but it also is going to be up to the behavior of people mm -hmm. that they're comfortable doing that. And again, that's where we think what we do in, in other companies is kind of an important bridge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I agree 100%. Um, I think we're, we're in wild agreement here. <laughs> Except on the details, because I think mm -hmm. that, that, that what you're talking about, uh, I don't think is consistent with it with ride sharing being able to flourish. And so um, what I'd like to do is, is get back to you with uh, you know some specific suggestions. Mm -hmm. yeah, sure, sure, of course. I mean, my, my main agenda is just to, to listen to your side of the story as complete as possible. I'm just saying that um, currently you, you were comparing a driver, uh, a part-time driver maybe, applying to Uber for the background checks for everything, right? And, and getting a, a Uber driver's license for a lack of better term. And well, they have to have a driver's license, obviously. Yeah, sure, sure. But, but a Uber driver's driving license. driving check. Yeah, right, and, right. and 4.5 right. stars. And then, um, and, and then we're comparing it to, uh, you know, applying to a local um, authority of the Ministry of Transport to go through a very similar, um, you know, background checks and, and criminal records, and then pass a written exam about the responsibility of professional drivers. Um, I, I'm, I'm saying it's comparable, but you're saying that it's not, so I would like to hear more. Right, well, our evidence suggests that things like written exams, again, okay. in, in the year 2016 mm -hmm. with, with technology, oh, it's going, to, anyway. going to you know, going offices, yeah. I think recognizing that you can mm -hmm. accomplish the same things mm -hmm. using technology in a more streamlined process. And again, 
that's, uh, again, based on a lot of experience about mm -hmm. someone who's just looking to do this in very part-time capacity, mm -hmm. and maybe for a short period of time, mm -hmm. is willing to do. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, it's a different set of requirements, I think, when someone, but although I think I think it's a, a, a good opportunity to look at what can be done to be regulated for the taxi industry, mm -hmm. too. Sure. Um, you know, to give them more, uh, again, maybe price flexibility, some mm -hmm. flexibility. But I, and I think generally this is good for drivers, meaning most of the people driving the Uber platform are just average citizens. They don't, mm -hmm. They're not professional drivers. But for professional drivers now, whether it's taxi, limo, or truck, the nice thing is now they have another option. Exactly. So it's not just choice for consumers who ride, it's mm -hmm. choice for consumers who drive. Yeah, sure. When, uh, when I was in Paris, one of the, the cars that I went into, I wouldn't even call it a Uber car because they have like five different smartphones. <laughs> on the dashboard, and so it, it does give a driver more choice. Uh, I, I do agree with that. Well, that's a great point because I think to, to, for really r ride sharing and floor sharing, what you'll find then is those drivers mm -hmm. will have our app up, mm -hmm. another ride sharing mm -hmm. app up, two delivery apps mm -hmm. up there. Whoever has work for them at the moment, mm -hmm. and so it's not an exclusive arrangement. For, you know, mm -hmm. they are not necessarily doing themselves as a professional driver. They're just mm -hmm. using their app and their phone mm -hmm. to make a little bit of money. Yeah, some of that delivering people, some of the yes. delivering goods. You know, as you know, we're doing food delivery in many places. Yes. So, like to do and that. so, so this this goes back to the, the open API idea because if we do have an open API of of those uh, all the ride sharing dispatches, is that food delivery and everything, then we can aggregate it so the driver well, doesn't see, that's have to. So you're uh, saying you want the government to basically be the no anyone, right? Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, but uh, again, I think that 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 sense of uh, you know, I guess the term is multi. Uh -huh. But that sense of uh, making it even easier for people mm -hmm. to make money um, on their schedule mm -hmm. um, uh, is incredibly important. That a regulatory structure that mm -hmm. supports that at the foundation, mm -hmm. uh, without providing the right kind of regulations. Mm -hmm. And again, I think what we see here is, um, you know, it is basically maybe some adjustments, but it's mm -hmm. it's basically grafting some things onto existing taxi regulations. Mm -hmm. And again, we haven't seen in, in the rest of the world that work. What's worked is brand new regulations mm -hmm. that uh, understand what ride sharing is and what it isn't. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but again, we're not suggesting we should not be regulated. Mm -hmm. uh, we think smart regulation makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And you know, we've got a lot of different, obviously Taiwan is as unique like every country is. Mm -hmm. But you know, we've got a lot of good examples of how other countries in the region and elsewhere have handled it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah, we, 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 did, we did look at all of it. Uh, last year when we were making this little uh, deliberation uh, about the what we call the private uh, for right, for, uh, for for profit riding because it's at the end of the day as you said it's making some more money so it is for profit of course, right. right otherwise it's just a community couple right no yes yeah. yeah. uh, you know that's right but but that I think that's what is required for people to engage in the activity because mm -hmm. they're obviously uh, want to make a little bit of money on their schedule mm -hmm. but the societal benefits that come out of that are pretty mm -hmm. incredible mm -hmm. I mean we're starting to really change the way I think we see people about moving around our cities. Mm -hmm. And they don't use us for everything. They use mm -hmm. it to fill in gaps. Mm -hmm. and so some people use three or four times a month, that's it. But those three or four times a month, they know wherever they are in the city, they can press a button and get a ride into a few minutes. Mm -hmm. And they use it in conjunction with public transportation and taxes. Mm -hmm. It all fits together. Mm -hmm. yeah, so but I but what we do is unique. Do uh, you know, right, so. uh -huh. I do agree. I mean, it's making the pie larger, so to speak. And it, it is providing uh, people who wouldn't normally be conveniently calling a taxi a, a way to you know participate in transportation, and so they won't, wouldn't have to drive their own car and right. things like that. So I agree, like one hundred percent. The and and I mean this is something that we can streamline. I, I don't think it's paper based nowadays to to take a written exam. When I say written, I just mean uh, written. Uh, so it has to can be like this written. Uh, so, but that, but I think our, our main um, difference still lies in uh, the view of the regulation we passed in uh, the previous laws, which you described as drafting it uh, onto an existing law, but which, uh, far as I understand, of course I wasn't uh, Minister of Transportation, but I did participate in an initial sketch uh, of the, the regulation. It, it is, in, in our idea, a, um, just a, a section, a new section. And it's not shared uh, with the existing taxis um, idea. The, the whole idea is not to convert, you know, existing taxis or existing fleets. It's to set up a, a diversified, a different breed 
uh, that doesn't have medallions, that doesn't paint yellow, and is exclusively art-based. And we almost uh, said that it has to be paid uh, exclusively through uh, you know, e-payment. Um, but I mean, uh, we, we have a sunrise period. Like for the initial uh, a year or two, they can still take um, cash. Mm -hmm. but, but eventually, they will all, all switch to e-payment, which gives a better all the trail. And, I mean, I can make your case also. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so I, I mean, I, I do agree on a lot of principles. So whether or not Uber wants to work with one of the fleets who did register and becoming a technological supplier, like you did in, in China, uh, in mainland, I believe, uh, or you want to you know, register a local company, it, it's, it's your choice, of course. But uh, is there a good choice? Right, but see, know? that's kind of a fleet approach as opposed to individuals mm -hmm. just using their own car or using this technology. Okay, so that's where the tension is. That's where some of the tension is. So as we look at it, we just don't mm -hmm. think what's on the books here and this threat of a massive fine on individuals mm -hmm. is consistent with really scaling. It's not just for us, but for others. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, uh, if it's okay, I'd love to uh, to get back to you a little bit more detail Go ahead. about um, kind of the arbitrage between mm -hmm. what's existing and the issues. But again, I think that sense of fleets, taxi companies, that has never been part of, I think, the regulations that have really worked well, mm -hmm. uh, that have really allowed ride sharing to flourish mm -hmm. and again the mm -hmm. ecosystem around it. Um, so we appreciate, um, I think, you know, your perspective, which is you understand the value of this. Mm -hmm. But sometimes there's a difference between because the devil is in the details, as they say. Sure. And sometimes very small things that may seem not um, terribly uh, obtrusive, really, in our evidence-based uh, uh, history, suggest that we just won't be able to see the scale mm -hmm. that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so I, I think we 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 have violent agreement. I think about the shared goals. Mm -hmm. I think the means to allow this mm -hmm. to happen. There's still some things we got to work through. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, so you mentioned fleet size and you mentioned the fines, right? Um, I think there is no uh, restriction of the minimum size of the fleet in our new uh, tax regulation. It could be just five cars and designed to you know share rides among themselves. But of course, I do agree that liquidity and and uh, to you know create critical mass in a certain region is important. So of course we do want to work with regional cities to set up uh, you know, like fleets that design for maybe uh, the nighttime, maybe for uh, special needs, and maybe for uh, you know, elderly and, and things like that, like special service uh, fleets, which is why we call them fleets, but they are really just in individual people who passed professional driver's license and want to serve that particular uh, public cause. So, um, and again, I, I don't really know which of these models would work, but we have changed the pricing structure so they can charge more, um, and, and even on surge pricing. And, and so we think there are some economic incentives for them to participate in this kind of new fleet. Um, and so this is this. Um, as for fines, um, I think this is not something that administration has proposed. If I understood correctly, it's the legislators from the legislative side, and I, I'm not in connection with that legislator, uh, so I just read public information as you did. <laughs> but the uh, public information says that it's to be charged proportional to the capital of the fleet um, company size. So, um, so which is why I think the press called it anti uh, well. <laughs> well, because you, you do have a um, you know market cap that is huge, right? So it's proportional um, in the sense of you know, strictly proportional. Right. So, but I think that rather than you know putting on historically large fines uh, sure. on individuals, sure. let's find a way to uh -huh. craft regulations uh -huh. that work for our shared goals and more mobility solutions, uh -huh. sure. uh, and ride sharing the floor. Uh -huh. Rather than, I mean, again, this is not that complex of an issue. Right? No, it's not. It, it's right. something I think. But again, uh -huh. that principle of making it uh, easy for individuals not thinking about this from a taxi fleet perspective mm -hmm. is really, I think, uh, is what is required to have all the benefits that flow from much. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, then and I think we, we all agree. So if you do have other suggestions to the details Absolutely. of, of how we're contributing, then we can talk about it here or we can you know, follow up. Well, why don't I think what I, I'd like to reflect on this conversation and, mm -hmm. and, uh, sure. and, and uh, whether it's as a follow-up call or we, uh, we put some thoughts on paper. Uh, you know, here's kind of what we see in the e-taxi proposal. Here's where the tension is, mm -hmm. uh, and some su suggestions yeah. for how to move forward. Mm -hmm. So that um, you know, I mean, I think there's Taipei is going to be such, uh, and really the entire country is such a great, I think, uh, uh, example of how ride sharing can really mm -hmm. 
help. I mean, you think about you know the government goals of you know stronger economic growth, and you know ride sharing surprised me. Six mm -hmm. years ago, we would have thought we'd be here in Taipei talking to you that mm -hmm. ride sharing can be a pretty important economic growth engine, but also from a mobility standpoint. Mm -hmm. Um, there, as it turns out, there was huge gaps in our transportation ecosystem. Mm -hmm. I certainly didn't have a full appreciation for it. So you begin to see the service really explode, and you see how it's changing in some way mm -hmm. uh, how people move around. And you know, millennials, if they have their choice, would rather not drive. Mm -hmm. This next generation, Generation Z, probably doesn't want to have to learn how to drive. Mm -hmm. So we have to have enough transportation options, I think, to support mm -hmm. those desires. And then once you get out of that, is obviously what we all want, mm -hmm. which is fewer cars on the road and those on the road and have more people. Mm -hmm. um, and as many of those as possible be emissions free or um, you know better for the environment. Mm -hmm. so, but I appreciate you taking the time. It's helpful to hear uh, your perspective on this. And I hope that we can figure out a solution that you know works for mm -hmm. uh, works for the government, works for us. And that's generally what we've seen around the world. Is this is not a uh, this is not a divide that can't be bridged. Well, I mean, I, I'm more as a technical geek <laughs> interested in, in, in this automated driving, uh, you know, long haul trucks and uh, really the flying cars, the vertical <laughs> project elevator right, right. uh, that you're bringing in. Right. And, and but these things have a distinctly different thing, as you just described, right? They don't. We, we don't have people who drive helicopters for fun uh, a few <laughs> a few hours or a few a few minutes uh, during their their business. It has to be something professional. Um, but there really is no, no question around that, right? Okay. And then, and then uh, for professional truck drivers, we of course is that um, establish a even more strict uh, regulatory structure, and we're not saying that people can just hop on a random truck and drive them home uh, as as amateurs, right? As just anybody can drive the truck. I, I don't think that's true, right? And even for automated truck driving, you still have to have the local part of it, right? Once they finish the highway. There has to be somebody who, who right now, to right, the technology the is is more for the longer stretches. Right, sure, sure, right, yeah, right, right, right. So at least for the next, I would say five to ten years, we have to work on the way to how to switch from autopilot uh, to the local thing. And then again, I I, I wouldn't really trust it to to a random person who, who just want to drive a truck for fun, uh, <laughs> even though they may have an amateur driver's license, right? So I think yeah. that's right, but I think uh -huh. there's a big distinction between that and someone getting in their Toyota Prius, uh -huh. who may be a teacher or, or mm -hmm. a student or a small business person, and right. saying, no, I'm going to make a little bit of money for a period of time. Right, exactly. So and, what and I'm saying is that, to encourage that. Yeah, right? yes, there are yes. some distinctions, I think. Right, so what I'm saying is that uh, in the long term, like our uh, emission-free and so on goal, uh, that your next steps uh, that, that's more robotic-based um, I, I do agree, and I think we can come up with innovative regulatory structures to make that happen. But, but in, in that future, it is actually the habit that you're now uh, building, in, in a sense, um, it is actually counterproductive to, to the future that you're describing, because at that time, we will need another professional class that can be the interface between the robots and uh, you know, the public. But I do think this period, so just in terms of passenger transportation, uh -huh. uh, to get people more used to uh, you know, not buying their own cars, not using as much sharing transportation, mm -hmm. getting used to carpooling. Mm -hmm. That's clearly going to be an important bridge to autonomy. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, yeah, but but then you, but, but then according to your plan, then you you will still need them to get professional uh, licenses as either robotic operators or augmented pilots at, at that time. Well, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, you know, I don't know if that's I mean, true. That's in your I don't know if that's true in cars, right? Yeah. I, I think yeah. flying cars are a different uh, mm -hmm. issue than. Them autonomous cars mm -hmm. that are on our service streets. Okay. Yeah. So maybe they would become guide, guide, guides or you know, guided tour operators. Well, the future is okay. going to be interesting. But what we know is right in front of us is uh -huh. let's make ride sharing work here in Taiwan. Sure. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So, yeah. So Minister, I appreciate the time. I'm, I'm very happy that we get to exchange candidly. Yeah. 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 Are these yeah. always better than the alternative, right? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Oh, cheers. Okay, so our consular would. Okay, and I do think that um, there is more um, more tension between e-taxi and, and what we think um, is required. So I, we will get back to you with some a little bit more specifics. Sure. I'm going to talk to my local team here. Of course. Yeah. Like that. But do you understand that anything is then I will Yeah, of course. Of course. Okay. Of course. Okay. Have a good weekend. Thank you.